Now give them a round of applause because now they're gonna answer your questions. So yeah, if you wanna ask a question, uh, you could just get in line or you can get a snack or use a restroom, but we're gonna be doing questions right now for as long as uh, they can take it. <laughs> Hello. Oh, okay. There we go. Hi. Uh, my name is Emily Cameron. I'm from Fresno. Um, thank you, Ray, for shouting out our problematic Fresno registrar earlier. Um, I have a question. So I really appreciate what you're doing in New York, but um, in California, um, what I've heard from my registrar is that um, anytime we kind of recommend trying to do better practices, it's always, well, we're going to do what the law prescribes. And I hear this over and over. So it's like, we have to do the bare minimum and nothing else. That's kind of her mantra. And she's actually the secretary of the California Association for the CACEO or however it is. So she's um, in deep cahoots with them. Um, so is there some way in California that we can kind of encourage our registrars to maybe do things that aren't necessarily like written in the law, or like or just go an extra mile or do, do more than is prescribed of them? I think what this is what this meeting is all about is trying to figure that out and, and um, you know I think it comes to oversight you know we have to be there and watch what they do if no one shows up then they're just going to atrophy into the least that they can possibly do and if we're there watching and complaining and taking them to court and so forth then they have to do a little bit more but I don't think that you're going to get them to do anything more than they absolutely have to I mean that's um, that's the kind of, although I will say this, there are some of these registrars, especially the smaller counties, not the ones that I had colored up there, but the smaller counties, and they bend over backwards to do the right thing. There, there's a lot of good registrars, and there's a lot of good people that work in each one of these districts. So, um, and a, a lot of things that they do are right. I mean, and we watch them, and we've tried to challenge them on a few things, and, and a lot of things are right. So, you know, I, I can't, even though I have a lot to complain about, I have to say there's a lot of good things going on with our elections, too. Thank you. Well, I would add the answer that you can run against them, and that will get their attention. Uh, so, I, thanks for a fantastic panel. Um, and since it was so uh, prominent in, in Virginia Martin's presentation, the bipartisan oversight of the process, which is really great and is enshrined in law, I believe, in New York and certainly in Pennsylvania, where I have the most experience. Um, but um, having lived for many years in Philadelphia, which is seven to one uh, Democrat to Republican, uh, most of the action in most of the really important races happens in the Democratic primary. So for example, the people who are going to decide whether Philadelphia abandons its paperless DREs, uh, they won a uh, majority of them by winning the Democratic primary. So this is really a question for the room. Bipartisan oversight is great in general elections. But in primary elections, in a country where most jurisdictions are overwhelmingly one party or the other, how can we start to think about what we should be requiring? Um, in, because bipartisan oversight is, is just the people at the top level of both parties working together uh, at the primary level to make sure. It, that's my question. I'd love to hear answers. Well, I, I would say the bipartisan oversight, uh, uh, um, you know, goes for primary elections also. I know there are a lot of people, even in our own inspectors, who I train every year. I've been training them for eight years, and they still don't quite get this necessarily, all of them. It's, it's not the, the Democratic inspectors that are in charge of the Democratic primary. The Republicans are in charge just as much. So you're not talking about that. Okay. What I'm talking about is the Democratic Party machine controlling primary outcomes in cahoots with the Republican Party machine against portions of those parties who are interested and involved and running, but who are not in with the machine, which is quite corrupt. That's the question. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, this one? Yeah. Hello? 
<laughs> Check. Okay. So uh, the reason why I actually want to answer this is because, so for instance, um, a lot of the Bernie people in California, the Democratic Party, were upset with what happened, and we never want to see that happen again. So what we did was we formed um, slates and whatnot, and now we are getting more involved within the party so that bipartisanship comes from different parts of the spectrum of the Democratic Party. So even for like our uh, assembly district delegates, that was even bipartisan as far as which side of the party you were on. We had people that were more progressive in there with more establishment people. So if, as long as you get coalitions of the people that think similar to you to fight to get the power within the party, the primaries will be fair in the long run. I think that's what we tried to do at least because I know that we didn't have a lot of people that were like, as far as the Bernie people, there wasn't a lot of those represented before, but now, you know, we're going to continue to push for more progressive representation in the uh, process as well, not just the party. So that's how I would answer that. Let me speak to this a second. I, I notice in my travels to other states, um, they have, as you're saying, in, in uh, I guess Pennsylvania uh, and other states are much more partisan in the way that they process the elections. In other words, they have um, when they're doing uh, a, t a manual tally or something, the only people that can be there are the parties. You know, it's like the, I don't know if this is a, this case, but unless you're a Republican or Democrat, you can't be in the room. You have to be associated with the party to be in the room. I have to say what your party is to be in the room. Michigan was like that. You have to be with a party. You have to have, a, you know, and they have all the party people. And um, I don't, I think that's over, over going on the party I think nonpartisan is very, very important to, to have nonpartisan groups that say we're not. Now, the problem with that is are they really nonpartisan or are they a substitute for some party? You never can tell. But it's different in the different states how much they do that. I think that's, a, that's something in California we don't actually have as much of that going on. So, I, um Professor Stark started doing some of the iterative details. I doubt a lot of the crowd really understands the methodology in that because he, he didn't get to the details. So it would be important that we maybe some, allow some time because he laid out the general principles and then I think many of us still don't understand how you escalate in the next step. So I think there's time for that, I'd, I'd hope, so we can understand this important audit methodology. And then another quick question to Professor Sark. Why is it there's so, like I approached Professor Reich, who has a great, a big megaphone, on some of these election issues, and he and other people are so silent on this. They're starting to talk about voter suppression and polling closing and things, but they won't get to the issues of exit polls, what they showed and how they differed in the election. Why are so many people in academia who have prominence so silent on this issue? You know, you speak out, but not many others. I, I, I'm not sure I have an answer to that. I mean, I, I, uh, it's hard to account for what attracts a given individual's attention. Um, certainly gerrymandering is very much in the news right now, and there are a lot of academics paying attention to that. Um, the computer science community has been paying a lot of attention to election auditing related things for over a decade at this point, um, probably actually um, more than two decades. So I don't know, um, Barbara, do you have a? And the gerrymandering. So, uh, on exit polls specifically, um, and I, I know that you work with them, I, mean, they, I have trouble knowing how much credence to give uh, exit polls because they really are subject to self selection bias who's willing to talk to you. Um, it's very difficult to get a truly random sample from an exit poll, and you can get non-response bias of various kinds, and people don't necessarily tell you the truth. And if their willingness to talk to you has an association with their political beliefs, then you're going to get a biased estimate. It's just, it's just kind of hard. 
what bothers me is not that the accuracy of exit polls isn't accurately described by a statistical measure like um, margin of error. What bothers me is that people often take two different approaches, saying exit polls are great when we're monitoring elections in sub-Saharan Africa, but they're terrible when we're monitoring them in the US. Um, and you know, from my perspective, they're just not very good, period. And if we have the ballots, we can look at the ballots. We don't need to worry about whether people are responding honestly. If we don't have ballots, we have a really big problem. So. I really am excited by seeing so many people involved in elections in this room. I'm John Tudor. I'm the untrustworthy, corrupt registrar of voters from Napa County. Uh, who, 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 who incidentally invited a risk-limiting audit. Um, by so, by so Dr. The, Stark. <laughs> and I want to just say that uh, a whole new wind is going to blow through California elections, and I just want to take a minute because I want you to be aware of it. This is not so much a question as a seed planting. First of all, I wanted to thank Professor Stark for coming to Napa County and doing a risk-limiting audit. I'm a great believer in manual tally. One of our vote paper ballot counting machines was programmed wrong in 2004. We caught it in the manual tally, went back and recounted 13,000 ballots, got the right count the second time around. So, it's very important that you pay attention to what's happening in the election sphere. Now, Napa County is one of four or maybe five counties that's moving to the Voters' Choice Act for June of 2018, and you need to be aware of that. There will be no polling places in Napa County in June of 2018. All voters in Napa County will receive a vote-by-mail ballot. We're already 90% vote-by-mail, which is one reason that we uh, volunteered to be a pilot project. There will be eight vote centers and eight ballot drop boxes spread throughout the county. The ballot drop boxes will be there for 28 days before the election. The vote centers in two cases for 10 days before the election and the other six for the weekend before and Monday and Tuesday of election day. So you need to be aware of that. The other thing I wanted to talk and thank Virginia for being here, coming as far as she did, is I'm an image cast system also from Dominion. We are going to their newest version as soon as the Secretary of State certifies it, hopefully within the next 30 days. We do, and under the certification for the image cast system, to what Professor Stark said, the image is the official ballot. Okay, not the paper anymore. The official is, the image is the official ballot. And I am going to admit in front of this group that I have changed a number of image votes, okay? Because that's permitted under California law. Just the way Virginia does it with her paper ballots, we have what's called adjudication. And our machine automatically spits out any image for human eye review that has an overvote on it. In other words, they voted twice for a one candidate race, or they voted twice for an initiative or a proposition and it automatically casts out any ballot that's completely blank. And you'd be surprised, no matter how many instructions you give voters, they're gonna circle the name instead of mark the oval, and the ovals are all blank. So we set our machines to let us look at those, and on a blank, quote, blank ballot, I will cast votes based on how those names are circled. Now, just so, Professor Stark and Mr. Lutz don't go totally crazy. When, when, I do change, when I do change the ballot, it says X change the ballot from this to this at this time and date. All right, so it went from an overvote to a vote for George Blow, and John Tudor did it at this time on this day. So when you go back and you had to dig out the paper ballot, you'd find it with that overvote, and we corrected it just as Virginia said for voters' intent. So I welcome all of you to come to Napa County anytime and uh, watch for the Voters' Choice Act. It's going to be available to all counties by 2020. It's not mandatory, but you are gonna see the end of polling places in a lot of counties as we go forward and a larger move to vote by mail ballots. The reason for that is twofold. 
California ranks 44th in the nation in eligible citizens who register to vote. We're at 74%. Napa County, fortunately, is close to 80%. So the legislature, with conditional voter registration, which Mr. Lutz talked about, is now in California. You can register to vote up to and including election day, now that we have a statewide voter registration system. The other thing was the June 2014 primary election, which is comparable to the June 2018, was the lowest turnout in California history, modern history. 26% statewide, we made 44% because we have a very engaged citizenry in Napa County. But the legislature said if you put a ballot in everybody's hand, they have a better chance that they're gonna cast that ballot. And with conditional voter registration, you hope that people who suddenly get interested in the election the last two days and realize they didn't get a ballot will come to one of our vote centers, register, and cast their ballot. So good luck. Welcome to Napa County anytime. And I want to thank the organizers of this conference for putting it on. I'm learning a lot, and I'll be here if anybody has any questions for me. My name's Tim White, black and white. I'm from a small county in Washington State. Uh, I currently have an eight-year effort just before the Washington State Supreme Court requesting ballot images, access to the paper ballots, cast vote records. I believe everything that would be needed for any of your methods. I was invited here and my goal here is to get amicus briefs in support of this effort from any organization. You can buttonhole me uh, afterwards. My question for you is, I'm a construction worker. I, Dr. Stark, on a good day, I understand chi-square and your algorithms, but my auntie never will. Uh, my auntie always understands, Dr. Martin, your hand count method. It's accessible to everyone. And I think that our intent with my case is very similar to Mr. Lutz. We're just further along up the chain to our state Supreme Court. My question is, do you see any conflict among between your three proposals that can't be all done, redundancy is good. Is there any reason why any one of your methods conflicts with either of the other two? Uh, I don't see a conflict among them. Um, what I think the, the threshold should be, if if one of the things you're not doing, if you are not doing something that has the following property, then I, then I don't think you're doing enough. If what you're doing can't correct the outcome when the outcome is wrong, you're not doing enough. Um, a full hand count can do that. The risk limiting audit can do that in principle. A suitable escalation scheme can do that. If the escalation scheme doesn't involve some really rigorous calculations, then how do you know when the right time to stop is or whether you should keep going? So uh, another way to think about a risk limiting audit is that it's an intelligent incremental recount that stops as soon as it's clear that it's pointless. And if it's never clear that it's pointless, it keeps going. So eventually to a full hand count. Um, in trying to get some, convey some intuition for how is it that you can learn something about this vast election with millions of ballots cast by looking at some tens or hundreds of ballots. Um, I mean, there are two analogies that I find helpful. Um, one of them is tasting soup. So if you want to know if a pot of soup is too salty, you stir it thoroughly and you take a tablespoon. And a tablespoon is enough. It doesn't have to be 1% of the pot. A tablespoon is enough whether it's a one-quart pot or a 50-gallon cauldron. Right? It's, you don't need a fixed percentage of the pot. What you need to do is stir it really well. And stirring it really well and then taking a tablespoon amounts to taking a random sample of soup. The reason it works is because it's stirred. It wouldn't work otherwise. But the idea that you need a fixed percentage is just not, not there. Another analogy, if you want to, you know, I come to you and um, you, you think, I, I have a coin, and you think that it's biased in favor of landing heads. You think it's not a fair coin. 
And um, I'm claim so biased in favor of landing heads, that means candidate A wins, right? We think of this as candidate A. And the alternative is that it's really a tie or candidate B wins. That would correspond to a fair coin would be a tie. Or if it were biased in favor of tails, that would mean candidate B won. So I'm, I'm, I'm coming in, I'm skeptical of your claim that this, that this coin is biased. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start tossing it, right? So if I tossed it 10 times and it landed in favor of your candidate, candidate A, 10 times in a row, that'd be pretty convincing evidence that it isn't a fair coin. And that's basically how a ballot polling risk limiting audit works. It goes, you can think of every time you reach into all of the ballots cast in the contest, it's like a coin toss. What's the chance you get a ballot for candidate A? Well, it's like the chance that coin lands heads. Every time you reach in, you know, if, if candidate A really got 60% of the vote, you got a 60% chance of getting a ballot for candidate A. In the alternative that candidate A didn't really win, that means candidate A got 50% or fewer of the vote. So every time you reach into the ballots, you have a chance of 50% or less of getting, getting a ballot that contains that candidate's name. That's not, I mean, if you, if you pulled 10 ballots in a row and got 10 ballots for candidate A, that'd be pretty convincing evidence that it wasn't really a tie. And, and that's basically how it works. Where it gets to be mathematically more complicated is, okay, so I'm 37 ballots in and I've seen, you know, 21 for candidate A and the rest were for candidate B except for the two um, undervotes that I found. Do I have strong evidence or not? And, and the rest of this is just math to sort of figure out how strong is the evidence based on what I've seen so far that, that it isn't really a tie, that candidate A really did win. Well, I don't know if that helps, but... The, the well, let me try to speak. That, 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 check, check, check. Hello. Why isn't it on? Oh, test, test. Test, 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 test. test. All right. Okay, um, I agree violently with what... Um, Professor Stark said, without uh, being violent, said, good, good job. But a different a point of view a little bit. Everything that he said was right, except I look at it as, how can I do this if, in fact, everything that he said is suspect, that is, pulling them and so forth, it comes down to how these are actually implemented. I mean, look, the 1% manual tally on paper looks just great. Not quite that great, but it's okay. It's better than most states. It can be very much improved. But it's implemented so pa badly and so differently by different counties. It's, it's just across the map. So what it comes down to a lot is how does it wind up getting implemented and how easy, how easy is it for us as the public to observe that and make sure that they're doing it? Now, here's something I wanted to just bring out. You'll hear a lot about cybersecurity, and elections now are, you know, maybe a, uh, what, there's a terminology they use, but it's, it's one of those um, uh, critical infrastructure, yeah. Well, in most, most companies, the paradigm is we have trusted insiders, and we have the evil outsiders that are trying to penetrate our, our security thing. And so basically, you, you just don't want to get them in. You want to keep them out, and then the insiders are fine. Well. Sorry, but the election field is completely the reverse. Uh, there are no trusted insiders, and the only people we trust are the very far outsiders, the general public. Those are the only people that we can trust, us. The, the, the insiders can't be trusted, and so now you have to flip it, flip it around so that you've got to get total visibility and transparency to what's going on so that the, so that the public can see what's happening. So I think what's going to happen is as these things roll out, the question is going to be how easy is it going to be to understand and implement by the election officials and how easy is it going to be for us to watch it so that we can verify that it's being done right. Otherwise, look, all of these systems, the escalation scheme and so forth, what Professor Stark says, we're, we all agree with each other, but we're going to have to try to see how does it actually play out. How does it actually play out? And we're not going to know that till we actually try it, I don't think. And, and, and downstream, we say, okay, let's try that, see if it works. It may not work out, you know? And, and then you say, okay, well, let's make corrections. But that's going to be, I think, the process to have to be used. I'm going to just two uh, brief things. So I, I agree w with everything that, that Ray said. 
Um, in, the devil is in the details. You, you need to implement things in a way that's, that's verifiable. You need to know that people actually did carry out the audit the way they were supposed to, and for that you need, you, you need some measure of transparency at least, and you need clear rules. Right? You need policies and procedures written down so you can tell if they're following them. Um, on the subject of transparency, I actually think that a ballot level risk limiting audit is more transparent than a full hand count for a couple of reasons. I'm not saying that it's preferable, but on that particular axis, it, it, it's more transparent for the reason that the way, the way it goes is you, you, take, you, know, you, you pull a ballot at random and the details for how you do that really, really matter. Then you hold up the ballot and everybody in the room gets to look at this ballot and you say, is this a vote? Whom, for whom do you see a vote? You know, and everybody says, it's Abraham Lincoln, it's Abraham Lincoln. I said, great, we marked down Abraham Lincoln. That is a whole lot easier to watch than going into a room that has four people, of, of four tables of four people, each counting stacks of ballots, doing a, a call and tally, so forth and so on. There's no way that a single individual in that room can even observe the whole count in that room, much less observe across a, a whole jurisdiction or, or a state. So there, I think it's a lot easier to, to, to do this where it's one ballot, you have to count to one. You don't have to count to 200. Um, so anyway. That. Dr. Martin, uh, redundancy is good is my quoting you. <laughs> From what I'm gathering, is it fair to conclude that using two different methods or three or four or a hundred to convince my auntie and the academic and the construction worker are, is helpful rather than having to pick one. Well, I, yeah, redundancy is good and having a very simple method and, and having a more complicated method. The more complicated method that we use is, is this, the optical scanner that is programmed a certain way relies on calibration that is accurate and, you know, uh, thumb drives that haven't been hacked, that sort of thing. Um, so we compare the two, and I, and I think it works very, very well. The, the point that I would make is it just doesn't take that long. It's not that hard. It doesn't cost that much. And it's something that everybody has come to, not everybody, but mostly people have come to accept in our county. And actually, I will say that um, when I started hearing about risk-limiting audits, I thought, you know, we really should try this in Columbia County. And uh, since we were... Well, okay, yes, you're right. <laughs> we are, we are, <laughs> to the extreme. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I put it to my, my counterpart and I said, you know, what if we, what if we tried this, this risk-limiting audit instead of doing what we're doing? You know, just try it once. And, and he said, I really don't want to. We have something that works. It's not that hard, it doesn't take that long, it doesn't cost that much, and everybody knows what they're doing. We, haven't, we have counters that know what they're doing, they're good at it. Let's just stick with what works. And so, you know, that's where I am with that. Let me just bring out one, one more very important point. No matter what method you use to do these audits, one thing that absolutely is required is a durable paper ballot that we can actually audit. And so many mach count don't have that. So, by pushing on no matter which audit approach you use, you're getting the most fundamental thing out of this, which is some way that you can actually go back because more than anything else in this country, I'm worried about those direct uh, recording electronic machines that we can't tell what's going on there. Thank you, my name is David Carey. Um, I have a question that I think was primarily intended for uh, Dr. Stark, but maybe can be adapted for the, the other two of you. Um, California used to be a leader in implementing, a, a national leader in implementing um, risk limiting audits, limited basis, pilot sorts of things. Um, they're, they're not anymore. Other states are kind of moving ahead. What would it take to get California to implement on a wider scale risk limiting audits or any of the other solutions the other two of you are, are offering? So um, I'm maybe not a, enough of a, I'm not political enough to really know what it would take, but um, California uh, started with AB 2023, which authorized a pilot uh, study of risk limiting audits with funding from the EAC um, on the order of a couple of dozen California counties participated, including uh, Napa. 
uh, at, at the extreme large end was uh, Orange County, and then in between um, had Alameda County and, and Marin and Santa Cruz and, and, and Monterey and a bunch of other bunch of other counties. Uh, I don't want to leave anybody out. Um, Yolo, Humboldt, et cetera. Um, Stanislaus. Uh, so after that, risk limiting audits. Uh, made it into SB 360, which basically says if you want to field new voting equipment in California that has not been uh, federally certified, then you can do it provided you audit the results using a risk limiting audit or what was dubbed a partial risk limiting audit if, you are, if your jurisdiction only contains part of a contest. And that was probably written so that LA County could pilot uh, their own voting system um, before there was a, a certification framework in order, in order to check it. Um, but there hasn't been a law in, uh, and then uh, after SB 360, uh, AB 44 basically says that any new voting equipment that is purchased in California has to be amenable to being audited at the ballot level. It has to re re create a cast vote record in a way that can be linked to the corresponding physical paper ballot. Um, so that was laying the groundwork for a time when sometime in the future we can have much more efficient ballot level uh, audits. But so far there hasn't been any legislation proposed either requiring risk limiting audits or even offering them as an alternative to the 1% for those jurisdictions that would prefer to do a risk limiting audit. Um, I learned that on Saturday, the, uh, what's it called, the, the, the Conference of California Bar Associations, I think is the, na the name of it. So it's basically the, all, all of the bar associations in California have a confederacy. Um, they, they, once a year, they propose a bill to the legislature and try to push it through. On Saturday, they voted to uh, propose risk limiting audits um, as their piece of legislation. So that may get um, some... <laughs> uh, so that may get a little bit of wind, uh, uh, wind in the sails um, for getting risk limiting audits moved forward. But I think basically, you know, the, the problem is, you know, we, we need to be loud. We need to be political. I'm not really sure how to do that myself, but people here are, yeah. So uh, we're going to take one more question, then we have to move on. Uh, I'll be the bad guy right now and say that. So uh, last question. All right, thank you. Um, first, I want to say thank you to the people who um, come who came, all right, well, who came from, um, like, the voter registrar's office. Um, as I sit here more and listen to everybody, it sounds like that's out of the frying pan into the fire. So that's really brave, and um, there are a lot of people in power that aren't going to find out what the people's opinions are right now. So thank you for that. Um, what I wanted to say was to you in the middle, Ray, um, I really am interested in looking at the copswiki.org um, page, you know, to find out about the election integrity work that you're doing. And I also wanted to suggest um, there's people like Upworthy, Crash Course, ASAP Science, and the State Bar of Georgia. They have a lot of information like you do condensed into like three minute um, visuals. Um, for the general public to access really dense information in um, a salient way. So I would ask that you do things like that so that I can share it with people <laughs> and um, so that I can understand as much as I can. Yeah, we have a lot of artists in California, so it's really possible for you to do something like that. So um, thank you for what you're doing right now. And um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Th thank you. and, and uh it is, it is our intention to do that. Um, I'll tell you, I, I, condensing stuff down and making it short and very easy to understand, that is a real big challenge for this particular field because it is fairly complex. And since I'm a technical person, I tend to go long-winded about things. So it is a challenge to get those down. But I know that's, that's an important thing in, in, in all aspects of encouraging people to um, take action and try to oversee their local government because there's a lot of these going to meetings I think is an extremely powerful thing to do. Pick a meeting, whether it's your council, it's water board, a fire board, just pick one and start attending the meetings for a while. And I'm talking about maybe for a year. And you said that attending meetings is like waterboarding? It's kind of like waterboarding, <laughs> yeah. Now you will learn what they're doing and, and you may even figure out that you could probably do a better job if you ran for one of those seats, or they may even induct you in for free. You don't even have to run. But um, it is something where we don't have enough people attending these meetings because usually there's no one there. 
And when that happens, it's just the officials patting each other on the back and giving each other raises. So we need to have some more oversight. Um, it, it's not a lot to ask. So just pick one, one meeting. Don't pick everything, even though you're responsibility for everything in the government. But I'm just saying, you know, just do your part. And that is also a goal of ours to have short things like that. So it is thank you for your feedback. And I want to get your, the URL for what you're talking about. So you can, thank you. So thank our panel once again for participating. So